Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome back to the analysis.news podcast. And this will be part two of my interviews with Bob Poland about his new book. Please join us. So this is the continuation of our discussion on Bob Poland's new book that he co-wrote with Noam Chomsky. It's titled The Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. And I suggest you watch or listen to part one because uh, you'll uh, this the part two will make more sense. But at any rate, here we go. So, Bob, let, let's pick up where we left off and dig in a bit into the book. Um, so you, you go through various areas uh, of sources of uh, greenhouse gases and policy that needs to be uh, uh, created. Legislation needs to be passed, regulations uh, to deal with. So let's just kind of go through some of them. And one of the big ones early in the book, and I'm going to quote from the book here. Corporate industrial agriculture is a major driver of climate change, responsible for roughly 25% of total greenhouse gas emissions, including CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, the three main greenhouse gases. So I I, I know this gets some uh, play or focus for people that really follow the story, but industrial agriculture isn't kind of front and center for people's consciousness when you think about climate change. And 25% is, is a hell of a lot. So, so dig into the significance of uh, corporate industrial agriculture and what are the policies that should be uh, developed? Uh, right. Well, when you say people haven't focused on it and should, uh, I think I, you know, I'd have to include myself as guilty of not having focused on it adequately uh, up to now. Uh, you know, in doing the book with Noam, uh, I thought, okay, it's about time myself, Bob, started to uh, give this much more attention than I have in my previous work. Because, right, it's not the majority of greenhouse gases, but 25% is a huge amount. Um, fortunately, I think we can think about uh, addressing the problems generated by industrial agriculture in very straightforward ways. There's really, you can break it down into two uh, sources of emissions and uh, expansion of emissions and loss of, of uh, absorption of emissions. And one is, is deforestation. So we do hear a lot about deforestation, but we don't hear too much about the magnitude of uh, the role of deforestation. And again, according to the IPCC's research, which is basically not their own research. They summarize other people. If we say 25% is industrial agriculture, about half of that is due to deforestation. Uh, so we've got to stop uh, deforestation and we've got to uh, engage in reforestation. That is defending uh, primarily, first of all, the Amazon uh, rainforests and stop destroying them and start uh, reforestation and then creating uh, work and opportunities for people that live in that region. Uh, so that's half of the 25%. The other half of the 25% is comes from industrial agriculture, meaning heavy agriculture through using uh, nitrogen fertilizer to increase productivity from farming. The, the industrial agriculture model based on monoculture crops and heavy nitrogen fertilizer and very heavy investments in irrigation, it does increase food supply, but it does also release greenhouse gases and as well as contaminating uh, the water and soil. So if we if we transition out of industrial agriculture into organic agriculture, um, you start to be able to absorb greenhouse gases. You do not release greenhouse gases as you would with uh, nitrogen fertilizer, which uh, releases CO2 and uh, methane. And so uh, that's the way that you uh, uh, address that 25 percent. Now. Uh, there's debate in the literature, and again, I'm no expert in the literature, but I've read it. I think it's fair to say that on balance, 
you do you will reduce food productivity by say five ten percent by moving to organic agriculture. And so what do we do? Uh, we need to increase food supply, not reduce food supply. Uh, number one is we start we have to reduce the extent to which we rely on slaughtering cattle basically as a force as a source of food supply because uh, whether or not you think it's moral to slaughter cattle, uh, which we can talk about, in any case, it requires huge amounts of land, which you can uh, replace with growing crops and even uh, replacing with other animal products such as uh, chickens and pigs, which require far less land. So we do need to reduce the, uh, our uh, requirements for uh, cattle hamburgers yeah in, in 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 the book you say the global population of cows and bulls is about 1.5 billion uh, far greater than other ruminants the cows are responsible for about 2 billion tons of greenhouse gas per year through their methane emissions and this alone amounts to about 4% of total greenhouse gas emissions as of 2018 Although I have to say, I saw a YouTube video. I don't know if it's just a joke or not, but maybe that is one place you could have carbon capture here, <laughs> methane capture. They put bags on the asses of cows and they farted into the bags. But uh, I don't think that's very practical with 1.5 billion cows. Well, you know, let's just change our diet even modestly. Uh, and, you know, on top of that, um, in it, you know, the, the level of food wastage is gigantic. You know, 40% of the food that's produced is wasted, uh, both in developing countries and in the rich countries. They're wasted for different reasons. In developing countries, 40% is wasted because the storage capacity is inadequate. Uh, and so what do we have to do? We invest in improving storage capacity. In the rich countries, 40% is wasted because people... Don't, you know, we order food from restaurants and it gets wasted. Uh, and so what we need to do is just think about even modestly uh, reducing the level of wastage. If you do that and even modestly cutting back on our consumption of cattle, uh, we will be able to transition easily into a dom an organic agriculture dominant system that will enable us to absorb CO2 and not expend CO2 uh, with fertilizer and therefore get to that, whatever it is, roughly 12% of emissions that are due to industrial agriculture. And it seems there is a public appetite to some extent for this, this Beyond Burger stuff. I know there's some debate about what goes into Beyond Burger and that type of uh, product, but there certainly is, a, 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 a in, even in some of the fast food outlets, you're starting to see uh, – grass-fed cattle, if that is going to be beef, you're starting to see more appetite for a, an organic kind of diet. So maybe the politics of this are, are not as difficult to accomplish as the fossil fuel politics. Yeah, it's it's straightforward. Now, we don't want to exaggerate it. I mean, I've heard people say, look, the problem, you know, the problem of climate change is the problem of cows farting. And yeah, that's about 4% of the problem. So let's not say it's 100%. Let's say it's 4%. Well, I would say maybe I should have focused more on the question of deforestation. Because that you could have a very similar issue uh, in terms of tra just transition for forestry workers. I don't think deforestation means the end of uh, cutting down trees. But but doesn't it also mean the planting of massive amounts of new trees? And, and, and that I can't see why the public wouldn't support such a thing. Well, I think we do have to stop cutting trees at the extent we're doing. And there has been some progress there. And the reason being, if we think that we need to stabilize at, within 30 years or less, uh, you know, when you chop down trees, it releases CO2 because trees store CO2. And then you also lose the capacity of those trees to absorb CO2. Now you can say, sure, but the trees are going to grow back and then they absorb again. That's true, but it'll take 30 years for the trees to get up to where they're 30 or 40 years to get up to where they're absorbing as they had been when they were 
the the previous ones were chopped down. So you know the re, the main reason the trees are chopped down is to create more land for cattle farming. So if we cut back on the need for cattle farming, we therefore can also release the pressure to uh, chop down the trees and uh, deforest as uh, in the Amazon and elsewhere. So if we go back to the issue of sustainable energy, uh, you've said that sustainable energy like wind and solar, the price point for this technology is now competitive with fossil fuel. In some case, it's even cheaper why isn't it growing faster? Why isn't it a bigger uh, part of the overall energy picture? Because if I understand correctly, it's is it not less than 10% of energy production now? Oh, it's much less. Uh, if, if we take solar and wind globally, it's maybe 2%, of which wind is 1.5%. And solar is one half of one percent, so it's it's minuscule. Um, that said, if we look at the evidence on the costs, so right now, if we look at the global evidence on costs, on average, solar is you know just to quote some numbers here, solar is at six point eight cents per kilowatt hour of electricity. Wind is 5.3, whereas uh, fossil fuels, they range between 5.8 and 17.7 cents. This, these are data from the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA. If we look at the evidence from the U.S. Energy Department, the Trump Energy Department, the numbers are the same. So why don't we just have this transition to these cheaper forms of energy? Well, because they're not there and, you know, you have to get over the hump. You have to do the investment, otherwise you don't get the clean energy. And so there's a lot of inertia built in and there is uncertainty and uh, people already know how to make money off of fossil fuels, especially the oil companies. So what we need to do is therefore, you know, uh, clamp down on the fossil fuel energy and then subsidize the clean energy and make it really easy for investors, public investors and private investors to start building it up really fast. And if you know, if you if you make it really hard and really expensive to expand fossil fuel energies and really easy and really cheap for clean energy, uh, things will move in that direction. But you're also calling for a big public investment in, in sustainable energy. Oh, yeah. When I say investment, I don't just mean private. I do mean some private. But uh, look, let's start with the public investment. I mean, globally, as we talk about in the book, we're saying, let's say it's roughly 50-50, 50% public, 50% private. But of the 50%, the 50% public is the leading edge, and it helps to create the market to make it viable for private, and we need the regulations in place uh, to make it very difficult to sustain fossil fuels in the private. In other words, for example, you say, yes, you need to cut utilities, you need to cut uh, your fossil fuel investment by 5% a year, period, or else you go to jail. You need to say automobiles need to be 100% uh, uh, clean electric vehicles in 15 years. Like there's in the state of California has already said that. And in Europe, they're saying that you need to say you invest in public transportation. You need to say for industrial agriculture, uh, we have to do combined heat and power so that we stop wasting energy uh, at, at the industrial sites. These are the various things that, that need to be done. You need to build up uh, heat pumps in, uh, in buildings and in, uh, in industrial activity, and you cut a fossil fuel and you cut energy needs by 40, 50 percent. These are the things that need to happen. They're not hard to happen, but they need to be incentivized. Now, one of the things Biden says clearly, I think clearly, and this is, I guess, part of my question, that he's for eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. 
Uh, now, has he said it clearly that he'll do it, or is he saying he wants to do it, but he's only going to do it if China and other countries do it? I think he wavers. By the way, if we even if we eliminate fossil fuel subsidies in the United States, that's not enough. Uh, you need to just stop them. You need to make it illegal to burn fossil fuels. So even to just say we're going to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies or maybe we're going to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, uh, that's uh, obviously a step in the right direction, but it's not enough. There's also a problem with that, that in the U.S. and even more so in the rest of the world, fossil fuel subsidies do get translated down to lower energy costs for working people and the poor. Uh, even in the U.S., fossil fuel subsidies are largely subsidies for farmers, and that enables the farmers to charge less for food. So uh, unless we have a way through which we translate the fossil fuel subsidies into clean energy subsidies, it's going to just mean higher food prices, which we don't want. And that's even more emphatic in low-income countries. So the main thing we can't do when we eliminate any subsidy is to uh, make it the burden of the loss of the subsidy to fall on working people and the poor. They, they, what happened in France, uh, they said, okay, we're going to jack up uh, fossil fuel costs through the carbon tax, and we're going to make it expensive to buy uh, fossil fuel energy, oil, coal, and natural gas. And that's what started in 2019, the so-called Yellow Vest Movement, uh, which is a mass movement against a carbon tax. And, you know, Macron, the president, the neoliberal president says, well, you don't care about saving the planet. And I do. And the people, the yellow vest people said, we care about saving the planet, but we also care about being able to buy food and put and turn on the lights in our house and afford it. So the a Green New Deal has to be absolutely laser focused on the distributional impacts of any clean energy project uh, so that when we advance a clean energy project it is also an egalitarian project that creates jobs and raises living standards for workers and the poor, not lowers living standards. What's your take on carbon tax? Because it's been critiqued that it's, one, a, a kind of a market mechanism, and, and it's too slow. It just can't deal with the urgency of the situation, and and it's unfair, as you're saying. The carbon tax can work. Uh, it, you know, jack up the price of, of, of gas in a car to, you know, $30, $40. Sure, nobody's going to be able to afford it. But the problem is, yeah, people's living standards go down. So the carbon tax can work as, in my opinion, as part of an overall project. And the carbon tax can discourage people from buying oil, petroleum, natural gas to heat their homes and substitute clean energy. And some of the revenue can then go into investing in building up uh, solar and wind and high efficiency. Uh, but it's not going to work on its own. And when you raise the tax, you have to absolutely be sure that most of the money is going right back into the pockets of working class people, middle class people, and the poor. And for example, in the book, we talk about distributing the revenue globally, the carbon tax, a global carbon tax in which the revenues, 75% of all the revenues is distributed equal to, equally to every single person in the world. Everybody gets $60. $60 means nothing for a middle-class person in the United States, but for an average household in Kenya of, let's say, uh, four people, that's $250. That's going to be, you know, uh, equal to, say, Five ten percent of their overall uh, annual income, so that's real, and it, therefore the carbon tax with re rebates, with redistribution, can be uh, an effective tool. Uh, you talk about the need for industrial policies. Uh, what what does that mean? 
So industrial policies really means more or less what we're talking about in terms of having a program to subsidize, finance the clean energy investments big time at a magnitude uh, you know, that reflects the urgency of the problem. Uh, that, uh, that in other words, you can get, if you want to, if you're a government or if you're a private, if you're a co-op, you can get clean energy investments for, you know, next to nothing. Uh, you, you, you want to borrow a million dollars and invest in, uh, putting solar panels in your factory? Uh, you're going to get it at zero interest. And that's, a big part of industrial policy. The other part, again, is we have to shut down the fossil fuel industry so that we have to say, right, uh, cut fossil fuels, your utility, you want to keep existing, you don't want to go to jail. Well, then figure out this year to next, whatever you uh, consumed this year in burning coal or natural gas, next year you cut it by 5%. And then the year after, you cut by 5% even more. If you do the simple math on that, uh, you'll be down to zero in 20 years. The um, funding of this, the, you talk about transferring funds out of military budgets, green bond funding by the Federal Reserve. Um, th this is funding for this investment in sustainable energy, just transition, and the various other parts of the program. You, you've done a lot of the math on this. Um, what what is you know people people I shouldn't say people <laughs> the Republicans say this is unaffordable this this is all going to cost too much it actually costs very very little and I wish I could yeah I wish we could get some of the mainstream Democrats to see these simple points uh, because it, whenever you talk about any cost you know you have to think about it you know just slightly in a broader perspective. Um, any investment in anything costs money up front. But the whole point with the clean energy project is that once you do the investments, like with any investment, uh, over time, you save money. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. If capitalists thought they were going to do upfront spending money and then not make it back in profits, nobody would ever invest in anything. And so what is clear with the clean energy investments, as I said, uh, we're already at cost parity, you know, it, to build, to invest in solar and wind, the cost of delivering a unit of energy to a household is average equal to or less than fossil fuels. Secondly, raising efficiency saves money. So, yes, you have to do the upfront investment and then it's cheaper. OK, that said, even the upfront investments, if people are talking about investing in fracking, why not invest instead in clean energy? And if the regulatory structure tells us, you know, you can't keep investing in fracking, you can't keep investing in oil, invest in clean energy, um, it will be done. And over time, it will be cheaper. All that in addition to, you know, saving the planet. Um, let's talk about some other issues that get debated a lot. Uh, one is the idea of uh, less growth. Uh, it's called, I guess it's called the degrowth movement. Uh, Michael Moore's film that he exec produced, I guess, was uh, the most recent version of that. Uh, you've been debating this for years. Uh, what, what's, what's your take on it? Well, uh, I want to preface. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't consider the degrowth proponents uh, the enemy. Uh, I respect what they're about. I share most of their values. Um, and if you strip away a lot of the rhetoric, what we're talking about is, you know, almost the same thing. Uh, so that's my first point. Uh, you know, w the idea of degrowth is, I think, overly simplistic. And when it gets to really focusing on the uh, solutions to climate change, it's just wrong. Uh, thinking about just growing less in a very broad sweeping sense gets us nowhere. Because what we're talking about in terms of building a new energy infrastructure, a global clean zero emissions energy structure means massive, gigantic growth 
not degrowth, growth of solar wind and efficiency. That's what we're saying. Huge growth. You know, as, I, as we talked about just a couple of minutes ago, right now, clean energy, solar and wind in particular, at maybe one and a half percent of overall uh, energy supply globally. If we want that to be 50, 60 percent within 10 years, <laughs> that is a massive growth project. Yes, we want to have degrowth of fossil fuels down to zero. So degrowth of fossil fuels, massive growth of clean energy. So the whole notion of sweeping overall degrowth doesn't get us anywhere. On top of it, if you just do the simple arithmetic, if you say we're going to stabilize the climate through degrowth, that also gets us nowhere. Because right now, global emissions of CO2 are 33 billion tons. If we cut economic activity by 10%, which is twice the level of contraction that we've already experienced this year due to the COVID crisis, a 10% depression, economic depression, will exactly mean a 10% cut in uh, emissions unless we change the energy structure. It just doesn't work. Again, I like the people. I support a lot of what they're thinking about. It just doesn't work. And so I think we need to get beyond that debate and focus more on the things that we want to see grow, such as clean energy and efficiency and, the, and reforestation and organic agriculture grow massively and the things that we want to see contract, fossil fuels, chopping down forests and industrial agriculture. The issue of carbon capture, uh, the, your critique of the Biden plan is it's so reliant on it. But is it is there something to it? Is it is it a technology that does need to be in, invested in, investigated, researched as part of an overall plan? There are really uh, two types of carbon capture. One is carbon capture and sequestration. So we have this capacity when we burn oil, coal, and natural gas that you take the carbon. And probably you have to turn it into liquid form. And then you have uh, these pipelines that store it underground forever. I think there's really no point in doing this a massive, massive project. And anyway, it's not safe because the, ca the storing underground forever, who knows what happens forever. The other uh, way to think about carbon capture is you capture the carbon and you convert it uh, into energy, liquid fuels. Uh, there's some possibility of that having some role, I would say, but that technology is nowhere. I mean, even the people, the biggest supporters of it say, well, we don't know. It may work in 20 years. It may work in 30 years. It may not work at all. So I wouldn't say shut it out entirely. I would say it is a speculative uh, maybe a technology that could be used uh, in 20, 30 years. But in the meantime, we already have technologies that we know work. We already know solar and wind work. Uh, we already know that reforestation absorbs CO2. We already know organic agriculture works. These are what we could call low-tech solutions and low-cost solutions. And if they're not 100% of the, the solution to getting to zero emissions, they've got to be 90%, 85%, 95%. And maybe in 20 years, carbon capture with reuse uh, can be, you know, five, six, seven percent of the solution. So the, the thing that's been bugging me about this whole thing for, for a long time is how the elites who really have the power to do something about this don't see it in their interest to do something about it. And I, I guess this, if you combine the Nordhaus thing we talked about earlier, this economist who won the Nobel Prize and thinks getting to four degrees is optimal, uh, which is not, uh, according to him, likely to happen until the next century, that means there's lots of time to develop geoengineering technology uh, that will suck all the 
uh, carbon out of the air to stabilize at four degrees or, or, or less, according to these guys. Uh, so maybe that explains why there's not this sense of urgency in the elites to do something about it between four degrees and, uh, you know, 70, 80, 90 years to develop geoengineering. Uh, the, what, why should I worry, they think? <laughs> yeah, that's probably at the root of it. And again, like carbon capture, these, uh, you know, geoengineering, su such as, for example, injecting aerosol into the uh, atmosphere that will deflect sun rays, similar to what happens when you have a volcano and a volcano uh, releases uh, the aerosol into the, into the atmosphere. And what we know has happened uh, is that that has achieved some small degree of cooling uh, right after you have a, a big volcano. And that's kind of the model that they have in mind. We're nowhere close to knowing whether this can work uh, on a global scale. And even if it does work, uh, whether there's any kind of negative uh, side effects. So uh, that's all at the level of speculation now. Uh, if you follow a Nordhaus, uh, as you just were talking about, w William Nordhaus, the 2018 Nobel laureate, uh, and when he says four degrees is optimal at, in 2150, uh, he does also say, okay, we can get to two degrees uh, warming by 2050, so in 30 years, which already the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they've already rejected it. That was the point of their 2018 report, which they said, we can't really count on two degrees anymore. The climate science doesn't allow that, that we have to be at one and a half. So even Nordhaus was um, openly ignoring. Nordhaus is not a stupid person. He can't be. Uh, but he was openly ignoring what the IPCC had come out with merely two months before his own Nobel Prize lecture. Nordhaus says, let's get to two degrees by 2050 and four degrees by 2051. That's our optimal path. That is brazenly neglecting what the premier organization studying climate science is saying is needed to stabilize. This is, you know, this is, and, and if, yeah, if the elites are saying, well, William Nordhaus says we can do this, Sure. And they said, you know, he's a Nobel Prize winner. Who's to argue with a Nobel Prize winner? Uh, that could be behind it. The uh, And even those estimations of uh, the IPCC, uh, later reports have come out. Uh, I quoted this in an interview we did earlier, but I'll do it again uh, because I think the numbers are so significant. Uh, the 2019 UN Annual Emissions Gap Report states that if all the countries that made commitments to the Paris Agreement fulfilled those promises completely, we're still headed for two degrees warming by 2050 and three degrees by the end of the century. Uh, I'll say it again. If Paris objectives are fully admit, uh, met, we hit almost unlivable conditions in 30 years and catastrophic tipping point in 80 within the lifetime of our kids. These assessments were based on all countries meeting the Paris Agreements, which we know isn't happening. Uh, if Trump's reelected, then what we're looking at is essentially by the end of the century, perhaps Trump getting reelected and nothing much changing on the global scale in terms of how countries are responding to this. The IPC says that we're getting by the end of the century to 4.8 degrees, not the four that Nordhaus is talking about. And then this is, I think, very important. The Independent reported uh, that the IPCC estimate may be low, quote, research by an international team of experts who looked into how the Earth's climate has reacted over the last 800,000 years warns this could be a major underestimate because they believe the climate is more sensitive to greenhouse, gas, to greenhouse gases when it's warmer. The actual range could be 4.78 centigrade to 7.36 by 2100, based on one set of calculations. And these calculations are by scientists that are part of the IPCC. So if we're not taking action now, never mind 
four degrees insane anyway that it's optimal, but it may not be four. It may be over seven, which is most of the earth is unlivable. Right. I think that the IPCC 2018 estimate was uh, alarmist enough. Okay, it was extremely alarmist in terms of uh, the, the where where we are and what climate scientists are saying we have to do. And so, okay, they said get to a 50 degree CO2 emission or 45 degrees in nine years and to net zero in 29 years. Okay, now let's say they're even wrong. Let's say this is an underestimate. Um, that's where we really have to focus. And all the thing of getting to a zero emissions path is easily achievable analytically in terms of the financing. And we simply have to take the people like Nordhaus and just say, we, you know, we can't gamble, you know, that you that you're right. Uh, we, we can't gamble. We can't play Russian roulette on the destruction of life on Earth as we know it. And and alternatively, advancing a Green New Deal that gets us to zero in 25 years or less is achievable. And it will expand job opportunities. It can raise living standards. And we build in a just transition for people and communities that are already dependent on fossil fuels. It's a program that is easily attainable, actually easily attainable if we're thinking about it just logically and in terms of economics and financing. All of it is easily attainable. What's needed, of course, is the political will, the movement to fight for it. And the development that I've seen and have have, uh, been a part of in a small way in the last few years is people in the labor movement uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere joining forces with environmentalists and others to advance this project. And I think once we have the labor movement and the environmental movement on the same page, uh, we're going to make progress in a serious way in the United States uh, within a democratic administration, at least that's that's the plan. All right. Thanks very much for joining us, Paul. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. And don't forget the donate button at the top of the webpage. page.